Welcome back, everybody. We are in our second last learning module for the semester, so near the finish line. This topic is language. This is a huge topic, and what we're going to do for this learning module is, one, there's no textbook reading, but we will do a quick general overview of the topic of language in this video. And then in the second video, we're going to dive into an interesting empirical article on a phenomena called the tip of the tongue. So let's get started on this massive topic of language. And language is super fascinating. Uh, it comes in a lot of different forms. We've got writing, we've got talking, listening, hearing, understanding, reading, braille, different languages, different cultures. Um, lots of things to talk about here. Uh, I'm going to uh, kind of sidestep a lot of this stuff because there's too much to talk about. So I'm going to take the easy way out here and answering the question, what is language? Question mark. Well, I'm going to say it's a big topic that's too big to cover in this mini lecture. But if you want a really nice overview of a lot of the aspects of the study of language, I would recommend this book by George Ewell. You can currently download it for free from Google Scholar if you search for it. And it's very accessible and gives you quite a large bird's eye view on many issues in the study of language. What we're going to focus on here is the cognitive psychology of language which I'll summarize in these three ways. So first of all, cognition researchers are interested in understanding how language abilities work. And this research that's been done, say over the last 100 years or so, has generated numerous theories about how language might work and discovered numerous phenomena that could be relevant to understanding how language works. Another thing that's happened in the cognitive psychology of language arena is a substantial amount of debate around the kinds of processes that support language abilities. I'm going to focus on this debate, debate in terms of a distinction between general process theories of language and special process theories of language. This, I think, is a nice way to look at some of these major debates. And throughout this lecture, I'll return to this distinction. So what's a general process theory of language abilities? Well, if you think about language, it is a whole bunch of different activities that we engage in uh, from all those things I mentioned just a moment ago. Speaking, reading, hearing, listening, understanding, comprehending. All of these activities are possibly mediated by general cognitive processes involved in perception and attention and learning and memory and motor control. So we might think about language as a complex skill that uses um, networks of existing cognitive processes. Another interpretation of how language works is that language abilities are perhaps somehow unique and mediated by special processes. So per potentially just like we think we have uh, kind of memory systems and perception systems and potentially learning systems and so on. This is one way in which people have described parts of cognition. It's, it's possibly the case that there's another special system for a language. And that system might operate on different principles than general learning and memory principles. It might be responsible for our language abilities. Or it might be a little bit of a combo of both of these ways of looking at language abilities. So I'm going to start off uh, with a kind of historical event that occurred right around the time when cognitive psychology was becoming a discipline. And this uh, was a, a kind of interaction between B.F. Skinner, who we've heard about before, if you remember back to our lectures on behaviorism, and Noam Chomsky, a uh, psycholinguist and, um, at the time. So these two had an interaction. Um, 
And I think this kind of debate between uh, general process explanations and special process explanations uh, can be traced back a little bit to this interaction between these two thinkers. So I'm saying the transition from behaviorism to cognitivism is exemplified by dueling perspectives from B.F. Skinner and Noam Chomsky. And I think this, uh, these dueling perspectives also caused a bit of a rift, which I will get back to in a moment. I realize I have to go down on this slide to get to the next one. So in 1957, uh, Skinner published a book called Verbal Behavior. And in this book, he applies his behaviorist approach that he was developing uh, with, remember, the rats pressing the lever. And Skinner was interested in describing a uh, coming up with a descriptive system to predict and control when the rat will press the lever. And so he takes those methods in this book and attempts to generalize them to consider all acts of language as, a, as an example of a behavior like lever pressing. So every time I say a word, each word is a behavior like a lever press, and potentially we could understand all verbal behavior from the perspective of uh, Skinner's descriptive system. And so it's a, it's a, it's Skinner taking a big swing at generalizing the principles of behaviorism. And in this book, he's very optimistic that uh, behaviorist principles could be used uh, to predict and control language behavior. Now, in 1959, Noam Chomsky reviewed Skinner's book, and he argued that uh, language abilities are too complex to be described by uh, Skinner's functional analysis. And he also argued that language results from inborn cognitive processes that need to be understood. Uh, so uh, let me say, first of all, this is a kind of a famously scathing book review. If you want to read it, uh, you can click this link and it'll take you over to Noam Chomsky's website. It's a, it's a wonderful review to read, actually. So how long is it? It's about, it's about this long. So I'd say if you're interested, uh, check out the review. But we can see in this situation, you know, Skinner is kind of, oops, let me go back here, arguing that we could take a generalist approach based on behaviorism principles to understand something complicated like language. And uh, Chomsky's suggesting that, well, actually, language is pretty complicated. And he suspects that there are specialized systems, say, in the brain for language, and we would need to understand how those systems work in order to really make progress understanding something complicated like language. Now, if we go back to this picture here, I'm going to suggest just as a, an idea that this difference between Skinner and Chomsky caused a kind of rift in approaches to explaining complicated behavior and abilities like language. So many theorists followed uh, the Chomsky perspective that language involved specialized processes. And we'll see some examples of that in a moment. Uh, so a lot of cognitive, so-called, I'll call them cognitive theories, invoke uh, systems of connected special processing systems to explain language. And these ideas are somewhat separated from some of the themes we've been talking about throughout the course. Uh, we've been talking about things like associationism, how people learn about associations in their environment. And we've talked about general learning and memory principles to describe how people learn about associations between things in their environment. And uh, so basically there's these two camps, it seems, since the 50s or 60s. One camp has been interested in 
how general learning and memory principles that underlie uh, association formation might explain or help us explain complicated abilities like language. And there's been uh, another perspective that, well, those kinds of general processes can only get you so far, and we need to consider more specialized language processes that go the extra distance, that allow us to do really complicated and impressive things with language that just learning associations won't be able to do for you. So we'll take a, a look at some specialized process theories, and we'll start with Chomsky's transformational grammar notion, and then we'll look at some information processing stage mod models. So here's what Chomsky suggested, and he has a nice way of writing about it. He says, language is a process of free creation. Its laws and principles are fixed, but the manner in which the principles of generation are used is free and infinitely varied. Even the interpretation and use of words involves a process of free creation. And um, I think this is, you know, it's a fun sentence, a fun series of sentences, and it reflects the idea that we can express things in many different ways when we use language. We can try to express the same thing using different words or use different words to express different things. And it does really feel like we have a lot of flexibility in how we decide to use language. Chomsky further distinguishes between surface and deep structure. So surface structure is the part of the sentence that can be segmented and labeled and by conventional parsing. So that refers to, you know, you can look at a sentence and say, oh, these are verbs and these are nouns and these are the different parts of the sentence. The deep structure refers to the underlying form that contains the information necessary for meaning. And this concept of a transformational grammar is that uh, we have some kind of process uh, that govern the transformation of one structure into another. So if I was to give you an example of a system of transformation, we could think of math kind of like that. Uh, here we have some math equations. A equals B, for example, is one way of saying the relationship that A and B are the same. We could write it differently. B equals A. And both of those statements mean the same thing. They have different surface structure, uh, but they have the same deep structure. Similarly, 4 times x equals 8 is the same as x equals 8 divided by 4. Both of these statements are have different surface structure, but they have the same deep meaning. And potentially, language is a little bit like this. We have uh, something like a we might have something like a transformational grammar for language. Uh, for example, we can generate and understand many different surface forms for the same expressions. Um, in other words, different sentences can have the same meaning. And potentially, therefore, we must have a process that allows us to compute the deep meaning or the deep structure that equates the surface forms. So one of Chomsky's ideas is we have a special language process that un at, at some level codes the surface formats of the signs and symbols that we use with language. And it also transforms the surface features into deep structure so that we can access the meaning of those symbols. And a general hypothesis is that the, whatever's going on there, the transformation from surface to deep structure is really fundamentally different from other kinds of cognitive processes, for example, those involved in association learning. 
Uh, Chomsky also had a controversial claim that involved a claim about innateness, the idea that the this special transformation process could be innate and hardwired and potentially not learned. The idea was that particular grammars uh, for one language or another language aren't themselves innate because, you know, people, they get uh, born into different language environments and can learn uh, to speak in different languages. So learning in some sense must be involved. Uh, but the idea is that humans might possess an innate schema for information processing that is related to uh, language environments or language stimuli. A related approach to understanding language. Oops, it looks like my video just turned off. Let me see if I can get it back on. All right, I'm back. So another related uh, approach to studying language that involves specialized theories of language processes is to think of language in terms of processing stage models. We've talked about this general idea before. Remember the assembly line metaphor of cognition, where information comes in through your uh, sensory systems and then gets processed. Maybe uh, you attend to some of that information and maybe chunk it, put it into short-term memory, maybe put it into long-term memory so you can remember it later and so on. If you uh, adopt a processing stage metaphor for cognition, you can come up with uh, pictures that look like this, describing language as a coordinated network of individual specialized subsystems for inputting and outputting language-related information. So let's uh, zoom in here a little bit and just see what we're looking at. So let's let's start with, I don't know, hearing words. That's what you might be doing right now as you listen to me speak. So that's a stimulus out in the environment. Sound waves are coming across the air and they're hitting your ears and they're causing hair in your ear to wiggle around. The vibrations in your ear get transduced and processed in your auditory cortex that might be uh, then extracting phonetic features of the stimulus to identify, say, the phonemes, the individual sounds of words. And then that might be sent to a place where uh, once you figure out each of the sounds I'm making uh, for a particular word, you could send that information to the next system that could identify the uh, phonological lexicon. So this would be the lexicon refers to word recognition or word knowledge. So after you identify this individual sounds, you might identify the word uh, that you're hearing. That could be sent to a system that pr processes semantics. You know, like, what does this word mean? Um, and I don't know, at that point, maybe you're hearing some words and you're thinking about what they mean. And then you want to, I don't know, let's say you're taking some notes. So how do you do that part of language? Well, maybe you send, you think about what you want to say in your semantic system. And then you send what you want to say, uh, I guess, in the form of specific words, send that to your output orthographic lexicon. That is something that mm, represents word patterns that you might want to write down. And so how do you go from, oh, I want to write down these words to actually writing them down? Um, this system that knows basically the plans or something like that for the general abstract plans for what word you want to say might get sent to a system that then transcribes that. So starts writing, uh, has more specific, let's say, plans for writing individual letters and producing motor patterns that allow your fingers to move around and produce writing. Um, 
All right, so we have this kind of messy picture with lots of different boxes describing individual potential individual stages about um, pieces of the language ability and behavior puzzle. When it comes to these stage theories of language abilities, they often make uh, similar assumptions. We're going to talk about some abstraction assumptions that they make. And uh, after we talk about these assumptions, we will talk about two examples of phenomena. These are uh, interesting findings in ex from experiments on language abilities that provide data that, uh, uh, let's say, challenge some of the ideas in these uh, theories. Okay, so stage theories often assume something called feature abstraction. And let's see if I can explain uh, this idea. So first of all, we should recognize that words, uh, let's say in English and in other languages also, they can come in many perceptual formats. So I have that represented down here. Uh, I've got the word word in different colors and different fonts. I could say the word word. You could say the word word. Everybody could say the word word. People um, have different voices. So words can look different and sound different and they can be the exact same word. So there's lots of ways, lots of uh, perceptual variability of, of words. And you know what? A lot of us, I think, have um, that are experienced language speakers in a particular language. What you can do is it's pretty impressive. You can go and fairly easily read words that are presented in different fonts and you can hear what other people are saying, even though different people can have very different sounding voices. So how is it that your uh, language uh, processes are able to um, hear the words that are being said or read the words that are being written, uh, even though those stimuli could be in lots of different formats. So one idea is that um, there is a stages of processing that are involved that uh, do some of the things right here. So this is the stimulus out there in the world that could be coming in with a lot of different formats. The idea is you have some early low level perceptual process that extracts uh, individual features like phonemes or letters from the stimulus. That gets that information gets sent to a word identification stage. And once you uh, know what word is being said, that can activate abstract cognitive representations for the word that um, are involved in word meaning. So uh, what's happening in these models is that the perceptual details of the stimulus are being filtered away uh, across the processing stages. You start off with um, funny sounds and funny symbols, and you end up with activating abstract meanings of the word. So this is one of the ideas about how it works. And uh, what's nice about this way of thinking is you can, you can test some of these ideas. And so we're going to talk about uh, two pieces of data that have been considered in relation to these ideas and have caused some rethinking about whether this is the um, best way to think about how uh, language processes work. So we're going to talk about uh, assumptions related to the feed forward processing in that, in that uh, picture that I put there and assumptions about the loss of perceptual detail. So let's start off with these two things here, the word superiority effect. And we're going to talk about memory for different voices. 
Okay, so here's the word superiority effect. A general question that is being asked here is how does pattern recognition for words and letters work? How do you look at something and oh, I can, you know, I can read that word or I can hear that word that you said. It's uh, something that takes practice and you know what's going on. So a stage model suggests a bottom up order. We start off with the stimulus out there in the environment. It gets processed into basic visual features that those basic visual features then allow the word to be identified. And once the word is identified, you can activate the word meaning. So it starts off, um, the stimulus is deconstructed into basic features. The basic features are reconstructed into a word, and then the word meaning is activated. And let me tell you about something that happened in 1969 and 1970. The, the general question in these two papers uh, by Riker and Wheeler was, does letter recognition depend on the context in which the letter appears. And I'll just quickly go through what happened here. So this is a picture from the Wheeler paper describing some of the experiments that Riker performed in the 1969 paper. And what happened here was participants would be staring at a fixation point so that, that this uh, little Square is meant to represent um, subjects sitting in a controlled laboratory environment, staring at, uh, it's actually a, a, a tachistoscopic display, a T-scope. So it's be basically like a, a library card or something like that. You can stare at it and this thing can like move them out really quickly. So you're staring at a dot and then you're going to view one of these different displays very quickly. So I can resize it here. So for example, here you might see a word get flashed at you, or you might see a single letter get flashed at you, or you could see this same word re with the letters scrambled, or you might see two words, or you could see two letters, or you could see two scrambles of the two words. So you're going to get one of these and it's going to be flashed really quickly. And then there's a test right away. You get this card. And the question here is what letter did you see in this position? So if you saw um, something on the, so notice, sorry, there's two rows here. There's a top row and a bottom row. So this card is saying, what did you see? For the thing that was presented on the top row in the fourth position, was it a D or a K? So for any of these, the correct answer would be D. Basically, this is a letter recognition experiment. We'll flash you some stimuli with letters in them, and then we can um, ask you, what letter did you see? One thing to note is that the stimulus displays were presented for a very short amount of time. Okay, so what happens in this kind of experiment is kind of interesting. Um, and let's briefly think about what the stage model might predict based on the concept of bottom-up processing. So what would be faster uh, or more accurate? Would you be better to say that's a D on a card like this where the only thing that's on there is a D? Or would you be better to recognize this letter D if it was presented in the context of a word. The idea of bottom-up processing might say, well, you'd probably be better in, in, in this display here because uh, the first thing you need to do is figure out what the basic features are and that stage happens first. That's the only thing on here. Um, so, I don't know, maybe that'd be the better one. That's not really clear how having other letters would help because you only figure out what the word is later on. Uh, so it's not clear that 
you'd be better to recognize this letter D if it was in the word versus just alone or in other things. Well, what the results were, they're presented over here, the results were that letter recognition is enhanced when the letter appears in the context of a word compared to alone or in other non-word contexts. So here's some example data, or sorry, it's the data from the, from the Riker paper. It's a little bit hard to interpret here. You have to know what these symbols mean. So one word, this is the uh, condition where the letter was presented inside of a word. And what we're measuring, what's being reported, is the number of errors that the participant made as a function of how long that uh, stimulus was presented. So lower numbers on this graph mean fewer errors. One W is one word, one L is one letter. So let's compare this line with this line here. As we can see, people are making fewer errors to identify a single letter when it is presented in the context of a word compared to when it's just a single letter presented on the screen. So that's the word superiority effect. And uh, these kinds of effects have potential implications for our interpretation, how uh, word recognition processes work. We can start to wonder if word recognition depends on an earlier stage of letter recognition why would letters be better recognized in the context of words than uh, non-word contexts? One possibility is that uh, maybe the stage ideas are a little bit wrong. Maybe word level recognition occurs before letter recognition or in parallel with letter recognition. Or maybe there's um, uh, maybe the task is itself not necessarily measuring performance at one of these stages. Maybe it's measuring some something else in performance that uh, could explain these results. So this is a, a kind of puzzle for the stage, uh, the the idea that we have totally bottom up processing involving low-level feature extraction to higher-level uh, pattern identification. Let's talk about one more interesting phenomena, I think, that uh, lets us evaluate some of the general assumptions of the processing stage models. So as we've been talking about, uh, when you are in a language environment, like you're listening to someone speak or you're reading things, we know that people can, in, in general, in most situations, in many situations, they can effortlessly hear words spoken by different people with different sounding voices. Some stage models make the assumption that uh, there is a stage of processing called speaker normalization. The idea here is that the cognitive system knows that it, uh, voice information can get into your ears with lots of different formats. And there's a normalization process that converts different sounding voices into a kind of standardized code that allows you to activate the abstract words involved, regardless of how the people sound. So this is a hypothesis called the speaker normalization hypothesis. Maybe that's happening during this low level feature abstraction, or maybe it's happening during word identification. The uh, main assumption, one of the main assumptions of this idea is that when you normal uh, when your cognitive processes normalize the voice that you're hearing, uh, this filters out 
the perceptual details of the voice and leaves you only with the abstract uh, word information that's being said. This kind of idea can be tested. For example, we could ask what happens to memory for perceptual details of spoken words. According to the speaker normalization hypothesis, people should not be able to remember the details of what words sounded like because the language processing system is supposedly eliminating these perceptual details during the normalization. At the same time, we could adopt a more general memory perspective and you know, we could consider the possibility that people can encode and retrieve many details, including perceptual details of their experiences. And this should apply to how words sounded when they were encoded. I mean, you could pause here for a moment, just think in your own daily life. Can you remember some words that someone you know said, and can you remember what they sounded like? Or can you not remember what they sounded like? These questions were asked in this paper here in 1993 by Palmieri, Goldinger, and Pizzoni. Their paper is called Episodic Encoding of Voice Attributes and Recognition Memory for Spoken Words. So here's what happened here. Participants listened to 300 spoken words. Each word that was presented was spoken twice. Some of the words, the first time they were spoken and the second time, they were spoken by the same voice. So they had different people uh, recorded versions of these words. The other half of the words, when they were repeated, the first time they were spoken in one voice and the second time they were spoken in a different voice. The test was a recognition memory procedure for each word. So you listen to all these words, and then later on, you're going to hear a word and you have to say, oh, I heard that before. Or if it was a new word that you didn't hear before, you have to say it was a new word. So what happened? It turns out that memory was better for the words spoken in the same versus different speaker voice. We can take a look at that right here. We're looking at the probability that the item was recognized. And this uh, black bar here, or black line with black circles, represents performance in for the same voice stimuli. And the open square represents performance for words presented with two different voices. Now, if the speaker normalization hypothesis was in play, people would be hearing the words. It wouldn't really matter what voice was being uh, used. They would convert the word into uh, abstract word knowledge and filter away the voice characteristics of how they heard the word. That potentially would uh, produce a different pattern of results here and people might not have any difference in their recognition memory for words, depending on whether the words were spoken in the same or different voice. However, this data clearly shows that in this case, there was an advantage for words spoken in the same voice versus the different voice. And that suggests that when people heard the words, they didn't filter out what they sounded like. Instead, uh, that information was preserved in episodic memory. So this uh, finding is consistent with a role for general learning and memory processes to be involved in word processing. All right, so now's a good time to return to this general distinction that I've been making about general process explanations of language versus special process explanations of language. We've talked a little bit about some special process explanations. 
uh, we're running out of time really this semester. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into uh, a deep dive uh, relating to general learning and memory accounts of language phenomena. I do want to point out that computational models of semantic knowledge have been successfully built from general learning and memory principles. One of my uh, favorite recent examples is reviewed nicely in this paper here, which you can check out. I want to end this off with uh, a general point and then with a kind of neato example here. So theories of what words mean have progressed quite a bit from the time of uh, Skinner's book and Chomsky's book review. Now it is possible to train computational models on large corpuses of text. So this is millions of digitized sentence examples. We could think about uh, this as trying to approximate the human language experience. You know, as you grow up and develop across your lifespan, you encounter words on a daily basis through reading and through hearing other people talk and what the things that you say. So you have a lot of experience with how language, uh, how words co-occur with other words in sentences. These models extract the associations about how words co-occur in context with other words. And based on this associative knowledge, uh, at least some of the most recent language models can perform remarkably well on language tasks.